how poets get their effects through the use of various techniques is obviously an important part of poetic analysis. And on this rainy afternoon, I'd like to talk about Gerard Manley Hopkins's use of three particular techniques in one of his short poems, Spring and Fall to a Young Child. First, though, I'll just say a little bit about Hopkins's use of rhythm. Hopkins wanted his poetry to reflect the rhythms of the old Anglo-Saxon language, the, what he felt were the original rhythms of English poetry. He called this sprung rhythm, and you can see it was really important to him. He puts these little accent markers in various places to show that he wants the poem to be read in a certain way. He doesn't want it to be, Margaret, are you grieving? He wants it to be, Margaret, are you grieving? And to that end, he puts these little accent markers in. If you're interested in that, I'm sure you can find out about it somewhere else, because that's not what I'm talking about today. What I want to talk about is the way that he uses the actual sounds of the words themselves. I'd like you to look at the way that he uses the g sound, and in combination with that, the r sound. Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove on leaving? By repeating the g and r sounds in these three words, he creates a kind of link between them. And he creates another group of words that are linked through the sound v. Margaret is grieving over Golden Grove on leaving. Leaves like the things of man. There are two words that are doubly emphasised because they come into both groups. Those words are grieving and golden grove. And there's another way in which those words are linked through their sound. We've been talking about repeated sounds, and the technical name for that is consonants, but there's a special type of consonants when repetition is at the beginning of a word, and that's called alliteration. So through the use of consonants and alliteration, there's a special focus on golden grove and grieving. And those two words, to a large extent, sum up the positive and negative sides of these opening lines of the poem. There's the golden grove, the positive, almost glowing feeling of the woods in autumn, and there's the grieving of the little girl who's crying. And there are other examples of consonants, the golden grove, unleaving, leaves, light, and then care for, can you? And of course, we've got the l, l of leaves like, that's another example of alliteration, and k, k of care and can, again, alliteration. And I'll leave you to think about how those might be contributing to the effect of those opening lines, because I want to move on to something else now. I'd like, first of all, to talk about the way that he's chosen particular words. Margaret, are you grieving? Suppose she'd been called Jennifer. Suppose she was crying. Jennifer, are you crying? It just doesn't have the same kind of effect. And Golden Grove, he's put these two words, golden and grove, together. And it's unusual. And unleaving is unusual in the same sort of way. It can be used to mean the leaves falling from the trees, but it's not often used like that. And then there's the rhyme scheme. Margaret grieving and Golden Grove unleaving. A two-syllable, or as it's sometimes called, feminine rhyme. And of course, all of this is framed as a question. Are you grieving because the leaves are falling? Can you care about such things? And then he goes on to answer his own question. And he introduces another technique here. Assonance, repeated vowel sounds. Ah, as the heart grows older. So the sigh of ah is continued into heart. And there's a, a sense that the atmosphere of the poem is going to change. It will come to such sights colder by and by, nor spare a sigh. The worlds of one would leave me a lie, and yet you will weep and know why. And I'd like to focus particularly here on how Hopkins uses the rhyme scheme to create that change of atmosphere. 
he starts off with these feminine rhymes, grieving, unleaving, man you, can you, older and colder, two-syllable rhymes, and they help to create the rather sentimental atmosphere that you get in the opening lines of the poem, and then that's followed by sigh, lie, why, these short rhymes, one-syllable masculine rhymes, that signal a different atmosphere in the poem. We can mark those rhymes as AA, BB, CC, and then DDD, three lines that continue the same rhyme. And that rhyme is also repeated in internal rhyme through by and by. So those three lines, by and by, nor spare a sigh, though worlds of one wood leaf mill lie, and yet you will weep and know why. Those three lines are linked very closely through the rhyme scheme, and they stand in very clear contrast to the lines that come before them. And the turning point is that word, colder. These lines give us a much bleaker picture of autumn. And when the little girl grows up, she will no longer cry for the falling leaves. And again, the poet uses alliteration with such sights and spare a sigh. But I'd like to focus particularly on what's happening in the following two lines with the repeated w sounds and the l sound. The consonants here creates a strong sense of conceptual unity between the worlds of one wood leaf mill which lie before her, and the fact that, though she does not cry for them, Margaret will weep, and she will know why. And again, Hopkins's diction, his choice of words, is very significant here. One wood and leaf mill. These are portmanteau words made up by the poet, one and wood. It's now a pale wood, no longer a golden grove, and the leaves are not singly falling, but clumped together in a kind of congealed mass as leaf meal. And those same sounds, w and l, come into will weep, making a strong conceptual link again between the image of the one wood with its leaf meal and the crying woman, as Margaret has now become. But she's crying for a darker reason, not just for the leaves, a reason which she, as a little child, is not fully conscious of. And so, to the ending of the poem. And again, the poet makes extensive use of alliteration, the n sound in now, no, name, and particularly the S sound in sorrows, springs, same. And that alliteration continues in the next couplet, in the next two lines. Mouth, mind, heart, heard, ghost, guest. And in the final couplet too, blight, born, Margaret, mourn. So here we see the direction that the poet's thoughts are moving in. Sorrow's springs are the same. The grown-up Margaret will weep because she knows she's going to die. The little girl Margaret, of course, doesn't know this, at least not consciously. Her mouth and mind have not expressed it, but her heart has heard of it. Her ghost, her spirit, has guessed. And then the final couplet, the blight man was born for. We were all born to die. It is Margaret you mourn for. She thinks she's crying for the leaves, but in her heart she knows that if a leaf can die, so can she. So let's look at those lines again now from the point of view of the rhyme scheme. Hopkins keeps those masculine one-syllable rhymes through name, same, expressed and guessed. But he goes back to the feminine rhyme for the final couplet. He's come full circle. He's answered the question 
that he asked at the beginning if she can really cry for the leaves falling. And the answer is, unconsciously, she's crying for herself. So by using the feminine rhyme here, he emphasises the unity of the thought content of the poem. And just to finish up, some comments on the diction. Let's look at Sorrow's Springs. See how that takes us back to the title, Spring and Fall, and see how he exploits the different meanings of the word spring, and indeed the word fall. I'll leave you to think about what those different meanings are, and move on now to the balanced juxtaposition of heart heard, a ghost guest, with ghost here meaning spirit, of course, and heart representing the unconscious, the little girl's instinctual self. And then that word blight, meaning plague or illness, but here signifying death, the terrible thing that man was born for. And then the little girl's name, Margaret, and the alliterative mourn, tying those two together. Well, it stopped raining. Time to walk the dog.